are Our guest uh, speaker today is uh, Professor Marcos Cueto. Uh, he's a leading uh, specialist in um, studies in the history of public health in Latin America. I won't give a list of his many publications because otherwise I will take uh, quite a bit of the time he has assigned to give his uh, talk. A uh, very distinguished uh, scholar uh, in the area of the history of science and, as I said, epidemics and uh, public health. And his talk today is uh, COVID-19, public health and necropolitics in Brazil. Marcos is a researcher and teaches at the Osvaldo Cruz Institute in Rio de Janeiro. Thank you very much, uh, Marcos, and welcome to the seminar. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, to Julie and Gabriela. And, um, well, um, uh, these are two pictures that illustrate in some way the history of the epidemic in, in Rio. Uh, I, again, there is a construction in my building. I'm very sorry. If you cannot hear me at any point, let me know. Um, uh, one is Bolsonaro in his first press conference uh, around March of uh, last year, where he called uh, COVID-19 a little flu and he is not, he doesn't know how to use a mask. No, he usually did never use a mask and he was against masks and he even in some cases related masks with uh, gay people. And as you might know, he has a long story of homophobic comments in his political career. And, and the, the other image is a protest in um, a beach in Rio de Janeiro of people. Um, I don't know the number, but it was very high, the number of people that had died that day. And they are dressed like uh, people that are uh, Enterrando, I, I forgive me this moment, I forgot the word, but uh, in Copacabana. And uh, after they were done, the police came and immediately destroyed this symbol of protest. No? And, and just in case, I'm going to say two ideas that appear at the end of my presentation. Uh, and also are in a longer version in a text in English that Julie was very kind to help me with. And if somebody's interested, I will be delighted to send a copy to receive some comments. No? Um, the two ideas are that some people thought that this, that Bolsonaro was basically a case of acute negligence of acute mismanagement and uh, a rational administration should be uh, replace him as soon as possible. And usually people on the center and even the center right um, pose this idea that it was an extreme case of mismanagement and uh, of uh, denial of signs and on the other side, many leaders in favelas and uh, health workers, organization of health workers, defended an idea and made popular an idea that existed before the epidemic that was necropolitics. Uh, that I will explain in a moment, but that there was basically an intention of Bolsonaro to get so many people killed. Um, so, um, first I will emphasize something that probably you already know, that epidemics magnify, intensify social problems that exist before the epidemic. No? In the case of Brazil, of course, the lack of basic sanitation, the number of social programs tried to resolve this issue for the past few years. Uh, racism, it's important to remember that Brazil has 
uh, the largest population of African descendants, about 50% of the population is uh, related to former slaves, uh, blacks or mixed people, and, and also has a, a minority of indigenous people in the Amazon, but that has been discriminated and persecuted despite the fact that since the constitution of 1988, they have the right to occupy about 30% of the land of the country, 30% of the land of the Amazon is reserved for the indigenous communities. But during the epidemic, uh, poor people living in the favelas are mostly black or mixed races, people in, in the Amazon um, that reflect a general problem of social inequality uh, suffer the most of the epidemic. Uh, there are a number of, uh, a few studies that uh, indicate that people, uh, the rate of mortality in the Amazon was almost as double that in the cities. And uh, 38, the black people had 38% chances of dying of COVID or 38% of them dying more of COVID than white people. A uh, uh, very extreme political polarization that came from the economic crisis. Some ways come from 2008, but it was felt, really felt in Brazil in 2013. And um, I will mention some of the problems that, I, I will not make a description of the um, evolution of the epidemic or the responses of the government, in any case, that is in this paper that I mentioned at the beginning, but I will mention briefly some of the problems raised by historians that have been talking a lot about this epidemic during this year and a half of uh, COVID and uh, all, also other social medical scientists that have been discussing the epidemic. The place where I work there's a department of history of science, but most of the universities like a medical institution that houses also the National School of Public Health. So there's a lot of social medical research in, that have been very active during this period. Uh, one that is relevant to historians is what is called present time history. This is um, current in history that can be traced to works in France in the 1970s, but that's been very important in Brazil. Uh, there's a journal on history and historiography of uh, current times, and there's a lot of discussion. And is an, I think an interesting discussion because historians usually have uh, an idea of the past that is not the same as common people. They establish their own frontier between the present and the past. When I studied history in the 80s, that frontier was in the 1930s. And the idea was that everything that came after the 1930s was something for political scientists or sociologists, that there were no good archives. And what I have seen the past few years is that constantly the frontier has been moving towards the present. No? Um, until, uh, a few years ago, it was common studies from the second half of the 20th century. And with the epidemic, uh, there are not many historians that have begun to discuss um, that relationship between the present and the past, making comparisons, offering contextualization, uh, risking a lot of uh, traditional lessons that historians learn, like avoiding being anachronic, or um, trying to get the best sources to their work. Um, but anyways, th this is an interesting current, there's an interesting discussion that is happening among historians today in Brazil. Uh, and it's also related to the idea that Brazil has a series of problems that are never overcome, that are never solved, you know? like the lack of a sex sanitation, structural racism, so that the history of Brazil goes through cycles. And related to that discussion is the idea that probably this epidemic is um, the nail in the coffin of a cycle that we experienced beginning around 1985. In 85, Brazil 
uh, had uh, began a democratic period. No, it was the end of the military dictatorship that began in '64, and we have had a number of uh, democratic governments until Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro was elected in, in 2018. No. But this was a cycle where there was a very progressive constitution where um, a number of uh, social rights were recognized for the citizens, like the right to health. Uh, Brazil is one of the few Latin American countries that has a national health system and had also a very progressive program of AIDS that was celebrated around all over the world. But since the crisis of 2013 that I will not go into the detail now, but there was an impeachment against the president that succeeded Lula, Dilma Rousseff, came a neoliberal government first with Temer and later with Bolsonaro. Uh, the Congress was dominated by an alliance of uh, conservative people, evangelists and Catholics that changed all the social policies that were being promoted in the past, not only by Lula and Dilma, but also before. No? The president uh, uh, before Lula was Fernando Enrique Cardoso for two terms, and he was a center-right president that also had a number of uh, social programs to try to reduce um, the inequality in the country. Many people are thinking that we are probably in a phase of decline and the end of this life. And there have been a lot of fear that has happened. Another interesting discussion among historians is the term of magic bullet. Historians of medicine use this term usually to describe a technology that is glorified. And uh, there's a lot of hope that the technology per se would be able to control a disease. No? Like for example, in the 50s, DDT with malaria. There was a hope that DDT was going to kill all the mosquitoes that transmit malaria. And some people believe the antiretrovirals of the 1990s were going to eliminate AIDS. No? And usually behind the notion of magic bullets is the idea that technology is not enough. That for example, in the case of malaria, you need also to create programs for people in rural areas to control how they manage the um, um, places where the mosquito can breed. And in the case of AIDS, you also need a public discussion about prevention and homophobia and to make people participate in the programs of uh, the use of this medication. In the case of COVID, I think there have been especially for Brazil, two magic bullets. No? One for Bolsonaro have been chloroquine. Almost from the beginning, he glorified chloroquine. And not because I think of his knowledge of the French scientists that defended chloroquine for, for the first time, but because of his admiration of Trump. No? And also because chloroquine was something that could be used without any quarantine, without any other uh, public health measure. And that is something that was important for him because he wanted to emphasize that the disease could be controlled without stopping the economy. And that was his priority. And vaccines that are more recent, began to be used at the beginning of this year in Brazil. Um, but in many places, especially now, there's a fear that vaccines have become a magic bullet, uh, an intervention by itself. I'm not saying that vaccines are bad. I'm taking my vaccines, my family too, but many times the emphasis on vaccination has led to de-emphasize mass uh, social distancing, soccer stadiums are filled again. So, okay. And this, are, this is related to an idea called necropolitics. And the person who designed this concept is a philosopher from Cameroon called Achille Membe. He wrote about necropolitics before the epidemic, you know, talking about 
the extreme situation in some African countries that were in a civil war. But his idea is that uh, there are cases where uh, neoliberal governments can decide who can live and who can die in a society. Uh, in contrast to liberal governments, so the beginning of the century, that usually even to poor people give an option on how they might survive if they change their lifestyles, if they become modern citizens, if they assimilate to mainstream society. But for Membe, uh, there is from the beginning of the session that some people have to die in order for others to survive. A very extreme and radical idea that has become very popular here with the high mortality. No? That is, of course, related with something that I think occurred at the beginning of the epidemic in England that was herd immunity, the idea that the government should allow the virus to spread so more people get infected and get immunity and that will create the natural immunity. No, but that has the assumption that a lot of people would have to die. And to another term that I mentioned here briefly that the government has already in mind that there are some individuals and communities that can be eliminated from society, from a, that are disposable from society. In the case of Bolsonaro, the first one were probably at the beginning of his career, gay people, he always uses metaphors with gay people in homophobic sentences, no? But later, people in the Amazon, because Bolsonaro, a solar business people in Brazil think that uh, the Amazon is a territory that could be used for commercial purposes. And of course, he is supported by miners, lodgers, uh, agro-business that want to use this land of the indigenous communities for their own activities. And there is an ideology even supported by some members of the army that the indigenous people should be, should be assimilated to our commercial economy in the rest of the country or just get rid about them. No, Bolsonaro a couple of times said that the tragedy of Brazil has been that uh, 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 one of the difference with the U.S. was uh, in the U.S. Uh, the army eliminated the Indians in the 19th century, and, and in Brazil, the Portuguese maintained an Indian population in the Amazon. No? And, okay, so the next one. These are images of people who support and are against Bolsonaro. Um, I don't know if you see the first man in the um, my left. Um, we don't want vaccine, we have chloroquine. No, that is interesting at the beginning of the, well, the beginning of the vaccination process and even uh, uh, towards the end of uh, last year, number of people said, well, we will not take vaccine, especially because it came from China and Bolsonaro spoke against China a number of times. And we have chloroquine that will allow us to keep working. No? Uh, the woman on the top, the blonde woman, also has a mask saying Vaccina, no? Like it's a, like a nickname of a Chinese vaccine. And I don't know if you read, uh, there is a second line saying Fora Doria, no? Get out Doria. Doria was a government of the state of Sao Paulo, a uh, center right politician that was a former supporter of Bolsonaro but who is going to run in the presidential elections of next year against Bolsonaro, or pretends to run, it's not decided yet. And Doria and the medical institution supported by the state of Sao Paulo that is called Butantan, made an agreement with China to produce a vaccine and most of the Brazilian population have been vaccinated with the Chinese vaccine. No? The other, vaccine mostly used has been um, done in cooperation with uh, England and my institution here, Cruz, and it's AstraZeneca. And on the right, there are people who are against Bolsonaro and they are instead defending the vaccine no? and calling 
um, to get rid of Bolsonaro. Um, that is an interesting question I have been asked before, how Bolsonaro lasted so long? And maybe later I will try some responses or in the next slide or, or maybe in the questions. No? Uh, so again, about necropolitics, this is an image of um, people from the favela in a protest against Bolsonaro with a slogan similar to what happened in the US and in other parts, stop killing us. No? Uh, they also have banners saying black lives matter and things like that. Um, the favela resists. And it, this idea of necropolitics has appeared in a number of publications, social media, newspapers, and, and uh, uh, I, I think it has basically three meanings, no? Uh, one that was used even before the pandemic, no? The, um, the favelas in most of Brazil are places where the police cannot enter. So sometimes they make incursions and kill a lot of people in the so-called uh, leaders of the crime gangs um, in the so in the so-called war against uh, drugs, no. And and of course, as in many countries, the major number of people in prisons are of African descent. And also, despite the fact that the uh, part of the Amazon has to be protected. For a long time, even before Bolsonaro, there has been a process of deforestation. It has intensified with Bolsonaro, it has increased with Bolsonaro, that has uh, allowed all these commercial businesses to enter the Amazon and even some of them to kill leaders of indigenous community. No? Another interesting concept that has become clear during the epidemic is that necropolitics imply that the state and provides very few social services, no? very few uh, tools, for example, to prevent the epidemic. No? It was a very, I think, uh, sometimes a very Eurocentric uh, idea that social distancing and homework were going to prevent the epidemic in Brazil because. In favelas, there were no conditions for social distancing. People live in small uh, spaces. In homework, many people do not have access to internet or schools, do not have a system for um, that kind of education. And almost half of the population is unemployed or do not have a stable job no, or have no social security. But also, um, the idea that the government hides information on society. No? There were a number of instances during the epidemic where Bolsonaro not only tried to promote the spread of the virus, but also to hide any information of morbidity and mortality. No? And there were big discussions with the Supreme Court and with newspapers and now um, I think, uh, I don't remember when, but it was late in, in 2020, a uh, consortia of private newspapers provides the information on morbidity and mortality for COVID, no? because the, the, the government at some point tried to prohibit um, um, the Ministry of Health to get that information. No? Um, and also something, but I think it's, it's open and, and there's a name that appears at the end of this slide that is Daisy Ventura. She's a lawyer that works in the School of Public Health in the University of San Pablo. And she identified during the year 2020, over 2000 um, decisions made by the government to spread the virus, uh, the coronavirus against uh, in favelas, against the elderly, uh, against discriminated ethnic community. Now that has generated an interesting discussion, well, interesting in project discussion on how to characterize the situation in Brazil. No? And there was even a commission from Congress making an investigation that released its report 
a uh, few months ago and was part of the discussion and they accused Bolsonaro. Uh, some people say it has been a case of genocide. Um, there's been a discussion because some people believe that genocide could only be used when there is a very clear target in an ethnic group. And Daisy Ventura, that initially defended the idea of genocide against the Brazilian population said, well, really is a genocide against people in the Amazon, the indigenous people in the Amazon. And there have been a number of reports how they have been suffering not only of the epidemic, but a number of social services have been retired, medical services that existed in the past. And, um, and that there is a, sometimes a discourse in members of the government that the indigenous people should either assimilate completely to mainstream society or, or be eliminated. And um, another term that had been proposed by this Ventura and was embraced by this commission in Congress was crimes against humanity. Um, this commission in Congress and Daisy Ventura believe that this accusation will stand in a legal, international legal accusation. They have gone to international courts to do it. And uh, that is something that they can prove uh, among other evidence with this over 2000 decisions made by the government to spread the virus. No? Two publications that have been important to shape these concepts have been uh, one that appeared in The Lancet and was signed by Brazilian scholars. And the title, title is very telling, no? COVID-19 in Brazil far beyond biopolitics. And the idea of the article and also of other people who defend this concept of necropolitics is that the notion of Foucault or biopolitics is ins insufficient to understand what has happened in Brazil. No? They argue that biopolitics is usually something where the state induces the society to behave in what they consider normal uh, lifestyles. But here has been a decision, an open decision of who can live and who can die during the epidemic. And Daisy Ventura also has a number of publications in Portuguese, but she also has achieved notoriety in international journals. And she has this uh, piece in, uh, in the British Medical Journal where she insists on the idea of crimes against humanity. And my last slide is that, well, inequality virus, I, just wanted to mention that Oxfam has an office here in Brazil and just and in, in at the beginning of the year released this report saying that social inequality was going to increase. It's something that for me called my attention during the most of the epidemic is the fragmentation of the opposition. Only recently, I think they have become more organized and that is related to the question that I pose uh, two slides ago on why Bolsonaro has endured all this project situation. And maybe one reason is that from the beginning of the epidemic, he began to give a subsidy to the people that was almost like a minimum salary, less than $100 per month, and um, created a clientelistic situation with many, many of the population. But that help him to survive. Something else that helped him to survive is in the past few years, the extreme version of evangelism has become very popular here in Brazil and also in Congress. And they see Bolsonaro in messianic terms as a return of uh, Jesus Christ. The military also support very strongly Bolsonaro. He was a former captain in the army. And a couple of times he has said that nobody can question his order because he's the commandante of the country. No? Um, so again, these two ideas that I mentioned at the beginning, there have been two concepts to characterize the, the governmental responses to the epidemic in Brazil. No? 
One is neg negligence, uh, mismanagement. Uh, there was a recent editorial in the British Medical Journal that also uh, went in this direction saying, well, this is an acute case of mismanagement and it has to be stopped. Um, but also I think that probably this idea of negligence is related to who is coming next after Bolsonaro. No? There are right-wing opponents to Bolsonaro that dream, I think, with some kind of Bolsonarismo without Bolsonaro. No? some kind of neoliberal policies that would not increase much the um, budget of public health or programs on social inequality, uh, but will not have this horrible discourse that Bolsonaro usually has fighting everybody. No? And um, for these people, I think for the people who defend the idea of mismanagement, the vaccine is a magic bullet. No? meaning that they hope to control the disease without any major social reform. And with one technical intervention that would probably give us a protection, hopefully uh, now that the number of cases has decreased. No? And the other concept that is probably uh, defended by underground organizations like leaders in favelas and indigenous communities that have been very active in social media and some newspapers and also by some organizations of, of uh, health workers and by some university professors is necropolitics. No? There has been also an interesting discussion on how there can be a regulation of necropolitics. Uh, for the past few months, we have experienced a decline in cases. Uh, hopefully this is not um, a preparation for a new storm because we are watching the news of what is happening in Europe. And we all remember here in Brazil that we had a second wave in January of 2021. And now we are going to the celebrations of the new year in Carnival and all the mayors of the cities are allowing these celebrations in the main cities of Brazil. Carnival is celebrated not only in Rio, but everywhere. Um, but in any case, during this period, what has appeared is the idea that also necro political governments can regulate the death of the people, the individuals that are seen disposable, that are not relevant for mainstream society. There will be a number of reports that the elimination of uh, social programs in the Amazon uh, medical centers in favelas uh, have created a number of diseases and that people are acquiring or uh, infectious and chronic diseases. Children are underweight. Uh, malnutrition is beginning to be a problem again. And uh, this process of flow that has uh, occurred in the past few months. Um, Something interesting also related to history of medicine is that um, there's a fear uh, among the poor and even among people who defend the notion of necropolitics that they are going to be destroyed by the elites or by the government. Well, some segments of the poor, not everybody. And uh, it related to history of medicine because um, African historians who have studied epidemics in Africa have found that societies with acute social inequality usually have the same fear. There are a lot of rumors that the poor are going to be destroyed by the elites. No? So these ideas, even the idea of negligence and mismanagement is related to, to this acute social inequality. And my, I end with a question, will we recover? I hope so. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcos. So we can now um, start with uh, questions from the audience. Um, um, well, I, you can either raise your hand and I can uh, see you, or I think there's also um, 
somewhere in the Zoom uh, panel, then there is a, an, an icon that uh, shows if you want to ask a question. Um, maybe I can uh, start uh, asking you something about the, um, I mean, for those of us who do not have a, a deep um, a knowledge of uh, of Brazil, if you can say something perhaps about the fact that, well, for a while, uh, the epidemic in Manaus was especially, uh, especially uh, serious. And uh, I was wondering whether you could uh, tell us uh, something more about the uh, whether there have been some uh, specific regions in Brazil that have gone through the epidemic uh, with more uh, with more deaths, uh, with uh, more serious uh, consequences. And, um, and perhaps where was Manaus the only one? Why was Manaus the center? Or apparently it, it seemed to be uh, for a while the, the center of the, of the epidemic? Yes, uh, so I respond now, right? Okay, so in Manaus, there was an outbreak uh, in March, 2020, a very huge outbreak. Many people, Many epidemiologists estimated that about two thirds of the population had been infected. And even people with Bolsonaro, physicians with Bolsonaro thought, well, they are already protected. They have natural immunity for a second wave of the epidemic. But, and, and they relaxed all measures. And um, they celebrated New Year at the end of 2020 and then at the beginning of 2021, there was a huge outbreak. No? Manaus is the largest city in the Amazon where 50% of the people have no access to clean water, um, mostly from, from mixed races and people from indigenous places. And uh, it was proven that, that it was a great mistake this idea of herd immunity, no? That also because it, that was a place where many people believe that a new virus called gamma appeared and later spread to the rest of the world, like to the rest of Brazil. The Northeast has been mostly affected, but Manaus is also interesting for another reason. And I, don't, I apologize if I'm able to explain it completely in my broken English, but. Uh, Manaus, you, you have overloaded hospitals, no oxygen, no mechanical ventilators. And, um, and the government sending chloroquine, no? not sending oxygen or ventilators, sending chloroquine. That didn't work. And um, what happened is that the health workers in the hospitals began a system that was later used in other hospitals that has, is called the Rodicio de Ambu. That is a word in Portuguese. It's um, Rodicio is like taking turns. And Ambu is an instrument for an artificial ventilation. It's the, it's the mark really of a tool that people use in, in emergencies to give um, ventilation to a person that, that needs it. But they organized a whole system in the hospital were health workers that didn't have sufficient oxygen or mechanical ventilators use this artificial and very inefficient tools or sometimes just push the chest of the patient and they take turns that was when it was called rodicio they take turns so they the, there was a constant pressure with the hope that later they would find um, mechanical ventilator available. No? So I think that um, it, this is an interesting case. Well, I have a section in this paper where this necro political decision of the government of uh, not taking care of the population led to this um, decision among health workers to choose who 
might live or who might survive because they have a few mechanical ventilators. They have to decide who are going to receive them. And for all parts of the population, they had this system, you know, that was inefficient and that about two thirds of the people that received uh, artificial ventilation never got to a mechanical ventilator and did not survive. So there was a very high mortality rate among the people that use the system of uh, Orodice Dambu. You know? So um, it was a very tragic situation and it was terrible also because it led to these decisions. It's not the first time that it occurs in medicine. There are a number of cases when doctors had to choose to what patient they are going to give a drug that is scarce or make a transplant of an organ. But this was, this reorganized that the work in, in the hospitals no? in a scale that was not seen before. Mm -hmm. um, I think Sarah, uh, you have a question, Sarah Abel? Someone else has a question. I, I, I cannot see Sarah. So, um, Evelyn Mesclier, uh, you have to unmute. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, my English is very bad, but I will try to ask a question to Marcos. Uh, Marcos, I was. Uh, it was very interesting for me to the the, the aspect of the magic bullet. Uh, because I think that we are all the countries in the same, in, in reality, in the same situation, uh, trying to, to use the vaccine as, as a magic bullet and not doing nothing to, to, uh, to change the situation of poor people who, who are the most affected by the, by the virus. So I wanted to ask you if uh, you think that this can change, that uh, if there is a debate, a debate, I don't know, <laughs> and in, yeah. in, in the international um, uh, organization of, of uh, health about that point, and if the case of Brazil is very different of the, the case of uh, other countries on this point. Thank you. Yes, uh, well, th this is a very important issue. And I think it's probably an historical trend uh, for at least the uh, 20th century with the emergence of uh, biomedicine and the power around biomedicine. There have been two main tendencies, and I apologize if this sounds too simplistic. No? But one has been to think that health is mainly a biological issue that requires a technological intervention. And that proposal has been very well taken by governments that do not want to spend too much money on health and um, see it as a minor program. And, and that thing that the role of the experts can be isolated from other interventions. And uh, the alternative, there have been another current that believe that health might have uh, biological causes and modes of transmission, but is sustained by social, economic, and political systems. And uh, to address the systems is crucial to have some kind of alliance between all the people involved in health. And that was, for example, the difference in the case of AIDS. You know, in the case of AIDS, you not only had drugs, but also you have a very active community of activists and NGOs that made alliances with um, governments and some international agencies to have a more broad program that included technology, but was not limited to technology. No? Um, sometimes the emergency, the sense of emergency, the sense of uh, urgency make us return to this traditional vision that health is basically biological and the solution is only technological. 
but behind that, I think it's also the idea that nothing really has to change in a society. No? And now we are probably leaving that again, the, the idea that technology will save us. And um, that has happened also, I think in the case of Brazil, because civil society has been disorganized for the past few years. I've been, the opposition has been fragmented. It used to be very strong here a few years ago, but for several reasons, it has been fragmented. No? Um, so yes, you're right. We are probably discussing uh, the place of technology in the future and, uh, and how we should not rely only on technology to overcome this crisis. No? But thank you. Any other questions? Pedro? Thanks very much, Marcos. Very interesting talk. Um, could you compare perhaps Brazil with some of the other Latin American countries, in case that in your, you, you'd be comfortable doing that? One thing that for me is a bit hard to understand is how recent data, the accumulated death rate in Brazil is not that different from places like Argentina that try to contain the disease much more. I don't know whether that's an issue with comparative uh, subnotification or other issues altogether, but given all of the terrible policy measures in Brazil, as you mentioned, I would have expected Brazil to stand apart from some other Latin American countries. And at least by the data that I've seen, it doesn't seem to be that much of an outlier. And in some cases like Peru, uh, the, the numbers are even worse. You know, have you got some, some analyses to share about that? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I think, well, I, I would say that in Brazil, the problem of uh, sub notification is huge. No? Bolsonaro decided from the beginning of not uh, deploying tests in the population. They only test people for COVID in acute cases in the hospital. So people assume that or estimate that it's 10 times more the number of people sick or that have died in Brazil than what the government accepts, no? Um, that, that is something I think important. And, uh, and that was a difference, for example, with Peru and Argentina where they were not testing everybody, but they were testing much more people in the streets. Something else is that probably something that they all have in common is social inequality and that Social inequality was a major factor to explain the morbidity and mortality during the during the epidemic. No, um, I know these are not complete answers, and that your concern is very just. And I will keep thinking about it. But thank you, Susana. <clears throat> you have to unmute. Um, do that. Okay. I have a question really that's related to Gabriela's first question. I was coming back from Mexico as COVID struck. And I remember reading somewhere that people were dying and the corpses were being left in the street. They were not being taken off to be buried. And I wondered if that was something to do with Bolsonaro or was it they didn't have the finance to get themselves buried? I wasn't quite sure what was going on. It sounded truly terrible. Yeah, that was Guayaquil in the beginning of the epidemic, no? Bodies were abandoned in the street. Right. Um, here, you, you didn't find that so much, but you find a lot of reports and probably you have seen images of uh, cemeteries improvised in different cities. And uh, that was, and um, I don't know how, how you say this in English, fosas comunes. 
How do you say Gabriela Fosa Common? I think it's like common grave, uh, perhaps. Common grave. They, yeah. they, they uh, uh, dig a hole and began to throw the bodies in a common grave. You know? And uh, that was stopped in some places by mayors and uh, governments or states, but for some moment that was done in the worst moments of the epidemic. You know? Even with a sub-notification, Brazil has been for most of the epidemic, the country after the US and India, the country with the highest number of uh, people who have died. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Marcos, I am curious about this, this thing of information, which is so, uh, well, as you have explained, so, so important. Um, is there a way, there is a, I assume there is a, an important number of independent institutions in Brazil as well. Maybe I'm completely sort of wrong, but is there a way to counter this attitude from the government of not uh, not collecting or not uh, revealing uh, the let's say well the statistics about the epidemic uh, or is this something that people have to simply well you know live with that and uh, not get to know uh, what the actual uh, number of people that have um, acquired the disease the number of death um so that this will be never known um, um I, I think it was in august of last year that the government prohibited the publication of the number of deaths of the epidemic and uh private newspapers with the help of ngos created a consortia and with some medical institutions to provide that information. And even to this day, the information that is released from Brazil is based on that consortium. You know? and, and the government doesn't contest that information anymore. Now, but the problem is that there has been an effort to provide social information, but this is a country that probably different from other Latin Americans. I don't know if Pedro would agree. Uh, public institutions are still very important. No, it never had like a neoliberal reform, like for example in Peru, where they privatize or destroy all the public institutions. Uh, there is a very strong, for example, there is a very strong uh, institute in charge of um, collecting. Uh, social data and statistics and organizing the census. And Bolsonaro, almost from the beginning, has been cutting resources from this institution and uh, recently almost prohibited the census. No? And the census is very important here because it's the basis to allocate money for some regions or um, communities. And, and that has occurred in a number of, of sections in the ministry. And, and I think it has occurred also because um, Again, I don't know if Pedro agrees. Public institutions here until recently have been very important. No? Uh, not all universities are public, but most of the best universities are public, no? are state or federal. No? Uh, the main university in Sao Paulo is part of the state, is funded by the state, and Rio Cruz, where I work, is a federal institution. No? There are Catholic universities that are also very good, but it's different from the rest, for example, of Latin America, that you have more private institutions that can come, probably are a result of all the neoliberal reforms that five few decades that can compete with the, with the state. No? I don't know, Pedro, would you like to say something about this? I, I agree. I agree with, with what you said, really, that my my feeling sort of what underlied my question as well is that perhaps the public health system SUS that managed to, to, to survive 
has made a difference and yeah counter veil to an extent the damage done by bolsonaro not completely of course but that this endurance of relatively or comparatively high quality public institutions yeah. and healthcare and data collection etc um is something to brazil's advantage in in a very complicated situation I was uh, asking that also because since you, uh, I think it was almost at the beginning of your talk, uh, you were saying how um, a historical perspective of, you know, how to write history of the 20th century had changed. Yeah. Uh, yes. And so I was wondering whether it is possible to imagine how the history of this epidemic could be written considering all these many, uh, difficulties uh, surrounding uh, the collection of information and the statistics of the epidemic, whether, uh, I mean, this is maybe something like asking you to, to in a way predict the future, but since you are a, a scholar of the, the history of, uh, of public health, um, do you think this is going to, to, to writing the history of the epidemics in Brazil, is this going to mean that will change somehow due to the uh, resistance of the governments to uh, produce or to let the public know uh, the real numbers and perhaps the geography of the epidemic or um, so many ad, other aspects also that are related to uh, to the consequences of of COVID nineteen. Um, how do you how do you see that? How how will the, the the history of this epidemic be written, and in what ways that history might be different from previous events, like like yeah. like this one? Well, that, that is a very important question, and there is a lot of discussion among historians of medicine in, for different countries. And uh, what I think is that what we might do is uh, recognize the limitations of our sources of information, use new sources, for example, leaders in favelas and, uh, and indigenous communities that are very active in social media, talk with other um, scholars, anthropologists have been very close uh, by Zoom or sometimes traveling with people in indigenous communities, also people in favelas, and um, recognize also that there is a subjective part in our study, and probably there is always it exists. And it's clear that I disapprove completely what Bolsonaro has done. And also something that I've been um, done, I think that is interesting is to try to organize the places where information can be collected. And uh, that databases have been uh, published or um, promoted or advertised at places where different materials could be stored. Something else is that we need like an effort to characterize what might be from our perspective the main problems posed by this epidemic no? in, in comparison with some ideas that we had in the past like magic bullets or necropolitics and also recognize that any interpretation that we might do about this data are is probably temporary and there is an historian that has called it like mid-level interpretations or that probably will not respond completely to historical questions. For example, is this the end of a historical cycle in Brazil? Uh, is this one classical response of an authoritarian government to an epidemic? But try to uh, address these questions and give a preliminary response. No? not only a description of what has happened that you probably will find it in a good uh, newspaper, but also uh, give an historical perspective to understand the present. 
So I know there's a lot of limitations, but and at the same time, there's a lot of pressure. No? Never before, insurance of medicine have been so demanded by journalists, uh, TV programs, and everything to speak about this epidemic and past epidemic. So some historians of medicine, I must confess, say, well, I will never talk about the present. No? I must confess I am weak. I succumbed to the pressure, and I decided to say something. OK, thank you. Pedro. <clears throat> If we've got a bit of time, let me ask you another question. It's about the, how you see the political implications of some aspects of the crisis. You mentioned a lot of that. One thing that has been on my mind a bit is how the elites have responded to this in Brazil. Of course, the population that was affected the most were, were low-income people, racialized populations, those living in inadequate housing, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it was a virus that worked through inequality to a large extent. But, but the elite also suffered in a way. One episode that came to mind very strongly to me was when in Manaus, during the peak of the disease there, there were no more um, air taxis, helicopters to fly out of the city. It's at the same time extremely revealing of the inequalities in Brazil that there are many helicopters to fly people out of the health system of the city and the fact that they had run out of helicopters at some point. So that means that even for the elites that were to an extent able to escape, they were suffering quite extensively with that. But I haven't seen much of a response from the elites to try and contain the virus in a more effective way or in a more equitable way. We're turning against Bolsonaro based on that. Have you seen anything along those lines? Do you have any thoughts of why the elite continues to hold on to other things instead of turning against Bolsonaro because of the pandemic? And perhaps well, a comment about the medic uh, physicians that have had an ambiguous relationship to that as well. Well, uh, that is a very important and interesting question. And I would say that at least part of the elite, the elite, for example, that have to do with uh, commerce, the elite that has to do with uh, commercial activities in the Amazon, have been supported in Bolsonaro, you know, but they are not the main elites. Um, sometimes they are not the main elites, for example, in because there was an idea that he was going to the economy over any, uh, for example, current time. Um, something else that probably, as you know, is that Bolsonaro was elected with to, and he or he appointed two ministers that were the basis of the uh, uh, government. No? One was um, a judge that accused Lula and launched a whole program against corruption called La Vallato, uh, the Judge Moro, and another um, an economist and businessman that promise that he was going to apply he said that never before had been tried in Brazil. His name is Guedes, no? Um, during the epidemic, he lost Moro, no? So he lost his, all his fight, all, all, all the symbol of his fight against corruption, uh, which, which is interesting because it also indicates of the, the important part that corruption has played in all of this. No, now this commission on the Congress has discovered that Bolsonaro committed a series of acts of corruption to buy chloroquine, to buy vaccines, etc. But also, but Guedes has, is still in the government. No? Probably today, nobody believes very much in Guedes, but for some time, I, at least at the beginning of the epidemic, I think that maybe members of the elite thought, well, get is, is a guarantee that there will be no populist turn in Bolsonaro because he has a populist side 
he wants to get the subsidy for the poor, no? Um, and, and there was a there was a confidence that Gates was going to maintain an orthodox neoliberal economic program. Probably today, nobody members of the elite no longer believe on, on this hope, no. And uh, probably Bolsonaro still has a possibility in the election of next year because he's probably the only the only barrier against Lula that. He, is probably going to be the other candidate. You know? There's a great fear among the elite that Lula might win. It's interesting also, as Pedro probably already know, that the third candidate is Moro. No? Moro has reappeared in the political scene and has raised all these issues of uh, corruption. And I think that he might be this idea of uh, Bolsonarismo without Bolsonaro, no? having like a rational neoliberal discourse in a fight, in a discourse against corruption, but without this extreme so Bolsonaro. No? But I would say that the elite probably supported Bolsonaro for some time, part of the elite because he was in favor of maintaining commercial activities. And secondly, because of Guedes. I, I don't know, what, what do you think, Pedro? Probably along those lines, um, still rather bet on Bolsonaro and keeping their position as elites than giving that up for an uncertain future that might be more equal and participate in that. I'd rather hold on to a class position, even though death is spreading and does reach some members of the elite, than reverse historical patterns of inequality in the country. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's correct. Um, disappointing, but not un, not surprising. Marcos, there have been um, several moments in which uh, Brazil has um, wanted to uh, play a leading role in uh, Latin America, or at least in South America. Uh, this was quite uh, noticeable under Lula. Um, in what forms do you think that, uh, well, this uh, Bolsonaro regime, and particularly the way it has dealt with the epidemic, has perhaps affected deeply, um, I don't want to say forever, but for a very long time, all possibilities that Brazil may sort of think that they could return to have a, a, leading, a leading role in, in Latin American uh, politics. Well, it, it's difficult to predict, but I would mention that that was an effort that can be traced to um, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, no? the mm -hmm. president of the center right elected in the late 90s. Uh, he also thought that Brazil could be a leader among middle income countries and the main speaker for South America with the US and create its own um, trade union called Mercosur with uh, countries of South America. No? Lula maintained that and maintained a very active policy with the uh, former Portuguese colonies in Africa, also in, um, in, in Latin America, and uh, used what some people have called soft power. No? They, uh, Cardoso and Lula promoted their social program, for example, to diminish social inequality or their national health system as a demonstration of their prestige and credibility and try to advance their own geopolitical interests. No, that was not done just because of self-interest. No, but every time Lula visited Brazil, he went with business people that after the talk of Lula tried to invest Brazilian money in those countries. And the same happened with Latin America, no? In, in Peru, for example, received a lot of investments of uh, Brazilian companies. Mm -hmm. So, but that has uh, 
has deteriorated in the, in the past few months. No? Um, there has been a complete change in the foreign policy of the country, and it's no longer an aspiration, at least not only of Bolsonaro, but of the former interim government of Temer that was about two years before Bolsonaro of having any leadership among um, middle-income countries, even though they could not destroy some of the institutions created by Lula, like BRICS, no? that is the alliance of the other middle-income countries like India, South Africa, and China, that still uh, stays and Temer has been obliged to attend the meetings and even Bolsonaro has been attending the meeting on the BRICS, but it's, 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 very, it's very difficult. Um, I must confess, and I, I hope I, I, or I'm glad that I was wrong, that at some point of last year, I thought that a country was on the verge of an humanitarian crisis, no? because it gave the impression that it was, I, I, I'm, I'm not Brazilian. No, I have lived here for over 11 years, but I'm not Brazilian. And um, forgive me if I speak to, I'm too critical of Brazil, especially Pedro, and I think that Carla is also Brazilian, no? but I apologize. Um, but, um, I had the impression it was a humanitarian crisis in the sense that it was a country unable to help itself, almost like a failed state where the opposition was too fragmented and there was no real alternative to also. It, it, it was, I was one, even the medical profession was fragmented. No? He was able to call up some physicians that defend the chloroquine for a long time. Um, now, being subjective again, I have a real hope on Lula. Lula is becoming an alternative and might win the election next year. I hope so. And we will recover some of this past, but probably you, something that I, probably, I, I don't know if you know this anecdote. Stefan Zweig was here in Brazil in the 1940s and wrote a book that has been very popular called Brazil, the country of the future. And they say that that is not, that is like um, um, a condena. How do you say condena in English? I just, uh, like a punishment, no? something that Brazil will not be, never able to overcome. It will always be a country of the future. It will go into cycles and return again and again to this promise that someday in the future it will be something else. No? But maybe we are at the end of a cycle and we might begin another one in the next few years. And it's interesting that another issue that a lot of historians have been studying in the past few years has been the military, how we came out of the military dictatorship, what happened at the end of the military no? and making metaphors or what happened in that period and what has been going on in this period and how we recover at the end of the military in the early 80s and how we might recover now from this all, almost four or five years of very terrible governments. I apologize again to my Brazilian friends. Thank you, Marcos. If there is uh, no other question or comment, I think we can um... Thank you for the talk and the conversation. And um, we'll close this uh, uh, seminar today and uh, to invite you uh, next week to our last, I think that will be a last seminar, uh, which would be on the middle class in Colombia, right? I don't have the name of the speaker in my mind, but uh, we'll ask you to, um, look at the next uh, announcement for our uh, last seminar of the term. Uh, muchas gracias, Marco. Thank you very much. Thank and uh, also to all of you for attending uh, the seminar today. Thanks. OK, thank you. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado a vocês. 11 anos. Então, que está morando no Brasil? Ótimo. 11 anos, sim. E está gostando, obviamente. Sim, 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 uh -huh. estou gostando.
<risa> José Muito, y no sé si vocês habían escuchado ese libro de Sway, mas fue una de las sí. primeras cosas que yo leí cuando llegué aquí. Uh -huh. Yo acredité que realmente Brasil era un país del futuro. Mas y un continúa brasileño... siendo. Continúa siendo, <risa> mas cuando comenzaron todos estos problemas, yo lembro que que fui donde un amigo brasileño y pregunté qué, qué acontece, no, no, no íbamos a hacer un país, me dijo, no, eso no es un pronóstico, es una condena, siempre vamos a hacer un país del futuro. Sí. Pero siempre, tomara que no sea así. Siempre hay esperanza, la esperanza eso, es el último que muere, eh, pues es. Eh. <risa> último. Ok. Ok. También. Marcos. Saludos, okay. un abrazo. Saludos. Hasta luego. Okay. Un okay, then. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Gabriela. Chao, gente.